So welcome to all of you uh, and namaste. And welcome to our uh, two special guests today, uh, Mircea Rainu and uh, Argopal Krishnan, for honoring us with their presence. Uh, and of course, Diniar Patel for organizing this exciting four conversation under the title Past Imperfect, Indian Histories of Business, Politics and Leadership. So since this series is held under the umbrella of uh, SPJM, our Center for Wisdom and, uh, and Leadership, which is, uh, I will uh, speak about it as CWIL, allow me to say a few words about it briefly. So SPJMR set up a, uh, this uh, center in April, 2021. And simply because there is a need for wiser leaders uh, to address the complex challenges that we are facing as a society as a whole. And um, as the global platform, what CWIL intends to do are two things. So first of all, is to bring together the domain and leadership and the domain and the various traditions of wisdom from East to West. And the second thing is to bridge the gap and make the wisdom researchers speak with organizations. And more specifically, what does it mean? It means that um, CWIL will um, uh, we'll partner with researchers like Diniar, like Mircea and so on across the globe to conduct some research projects which are relevant to address contemporary world problems, but from a wisdom perspective. And the approach will be deliberately multidisciplinary. So history, as we have historians today, neurosciences, philosophy, developmental, organizational psychology, spirituality, ethics, sociology, and of course, leadership, right? Second, we will, um, will, will offer practitioners, organization, both from profit and non-profit sectors. So to executives, CXOs, CEOs, and so on. Some evidence-based wisdom intervention. So this intervention will be in the form of, uh, for example, executive education modules, workshops, webinars such as this one. And we plan also to have a practitioner oriented journal and one annual international conference gathering and making these two groups of people, the researchers and the practitioner speak together. Now, to end, what are the three area of focus more specifically of the center? So first of all, what are the insights along with their reflective and contemplative practices, which the Indian wisdom tradition, because we're in India. So I'm speaking about Vedanta, Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, Jainism Sufism, Yoga, Buddhism. And also if we look further East, Taoism and Confucianism, what can they offer for leadership development to renew this field? Second area of focus, can we come to some definition of what are the wisdom-based leadership skills which are required to create a flourishing society? Not only that, how can these skills be developed and nurtured? And also important question, how can we measure the development of these skills on, in individuals and in organizations as well? Right? Finally, the third area, is about what can we learn from wise and also not so wise leaders? And what is wise leadership in politics, in business, in administration, in governance, across history? And obviously this is um, uh, the field of, uh, of Diniar and Diniar is in charge at the, at the center of this uh, area, uh, which is called history and leadership. So I will end it now. And time has come for Lidiar, uh, Dinyar to take over. So thanks again, Dinyar, uh, for having curated all these four wonderful conversation. And just on to you now. Thank you, Sylvia. And uh, good evening to all of you who are joining us in, in India. Um, so today's event, which is, as Surya mentions, the, the first event that we have in the series, Past Imperfect, uh, focuses on a new book that uh, Mircea Riano, who's with us, has written. On, on the Tatas, um, and uh, you know it's 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 a it's a really phenomenal account of 
an extremely long time period. I mean, if, if you look at uh, the, the corporate history of, of, of any group that has been around for well over 150 years, uh, that is obviously something which requires a great deal of work and effort. And at least, you know, during our time together in graduate school, I had a chance to talk to Mircha about some of the work that he was doing in archival facilities here in India, as well as uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, the Financial Times has recently reviewed uh, the book positively, uh, and uh, you know the review has said, you know, put the account of how one conglomerate came to dominate India's economy for much of the past 150 years makes timely reading for those reflecting on whether capitalism and corporate power in India is entering a new era. End quote. Uh, so. Uh, let me just introduce uh, the panel members today. I'm uh, a professor here at SPGMR, uh, focusing on, on, on uh, the history of modern India. Uh, Mircha is an assistant professor of history at the University of, of Maryland, and he's joining us from, uh, from there right now, from uh, the east coast of the US. Uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan uh, is a familiar face at SPGMR. He's an executive in residence here. Uh, he has been the director of Tata Sons and vice chairman of Hindustan Unilever, in addition to authoring and co-authoring uh, several books. So with that, let me ask uh, Mircha to give a brief presentation, after which both myself and Mr. Kopala Krishna will ask a few questions. And after that, we'll open it up to general questions and answers. Uh, thank you, Dinyar, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to um, all of you for coming. It's an honor to be here with Mr. Gopal Krishnan and to speak to you about my book. So I will speak for about uh, 10 minutes and uh, I will share my screen um, and just briefly introduce uh, the book, uh, what, why I wrote it and what's in it. Uh, and then uh, we'll move on to um, a question. So uh, let me share now. Are you all able to see the PowerPoint? Okay, if there are any issues, please let me know as I go through the slideshow. So uh, sometimes I'm asked, uh, this first slide is usually what I give to um, American audiences so or other audiences uh, around the world. So to many of you, this will be a familiar um, chart. This will be a familiar argument that I'm about to make. But I think it's important to make it again, because it tells you why uh, one of the reasons why I wrote this book. So if we look at the top business groups in India uh, over the past, this is half century, but we can extend this back into the colonial period. Um, this is measured by assets. You can measure them differently. Um, in this one, Tata comes out on top in 1951, 1990, and whatever. This is 2016, um, which is when I was finishing my uh, PhD thesis. Um, there are other ways of measuring it, but Tata will come out somewhere near number one or number two or maybe number three, uh, varying, de depends on how you count it uh, and what you measure. And as I said, uh, Dinyar mentioned the long period of time that this book covers and we can go even further back in time. Now this I would suggest is remarkable by itself. And um, I usually, this is what I show my American audiences. This is the comparison of the United States, 1917, 1967, and 2017. Um, and we see very different names in each of these historical periods. We see some that are, um, uh, that are the same across the three, but not many. So um, to me, uh, this speaks of continuity. Now, whether this continuity is ultimately a good or a bad thing, it's desirable or undesirable, is not for the historian to judge, but it is a reason to investigate. And so Tata's quite extraordinary uh, continuity at the top over time is one of the reasons why I chose to write this book. The other is the sheer diversification of the group. Um, so the Tata group today, as many of you undoubtedly know, is a uh, truly diversified conglomerate, a salt to software, T to IT group, and we can count uh, a number of companies in many, many different sectors uh, uh, in the group. Now, again, this by itself is not unique. There are many diversified groups around the world, especially in the so-called emerging markets in Latin America, in South Asia, in Africa, and East Asia. So there's really no, uh, uh, that by itself uh, is not a reason to write this book. Uh, 
But if we put that together with the continuity that I just mentioned, and if we also consider that if we go back a century to what the Tata group was, um, say in the early 1920s, what we see is that the founder Jamsheji Tata had uh, what I call in the book, the, the three dreams, but, um, or do I, I don't know if I refer to that in the book, but there were, uh, it's often known as the three dreams and uh, that would be his first three major ventures uh, in, in a colonial context to industrialize India. Um, one of which was the textile mills that you see here, the Empress Mills in Nagpur, the Swadeshi Mills, the generation of hydroelectric power number two, uh, and up here, of course, the Tata Iron and Steelworks Tisco in Jamshedpur, with the extra bonus of the Taj Hotel in the middle here. Now, what is remarkable is that with the partial exception of the textile mills, um, the Tatas are still involved in at least these three uh, areas and the Tatas are still involved in many of the businesses that they pioneered in the early half of the 20th century. And that's another remarkable continuity that we don't see uh, around, uh, around the world in these diversified conglomerates. So if we think about um, the history of global capitalism as having several different phases, uh, as I write in the book, Tata contains these phases all at once in itself, and it continues to live on and continues to survive. So if we put all these things together, that is why I chose to write this book on Tata. Now, what do I contribute? What do I say about Tata that is different from what others have written about Tata? Because there are many, many studies uh, of, this, uh, of this group for, good re for the reasons that I've mentioned. So uh, I take uh, a somewhat of an academic approach to this subject and I try to look at what are the underlying factors that explain that continuity and that resilience of the group over this 150 years. So the three factors that I've identified and these are the way that I have structured the book is around these three factors are um, what I call extraterritorial financial connections. That is to say, connections outside of India, especially with East Asia, with China and Japan and in the uh, late 19th century, and then with the United States beginning in the early 20th century. And these are connections that go beyond the relationship between India and the British. Um, and these I think are a major factor in Tata's success. The second is the quasi-sovereign control over land, labor, and natural resources within India, especially in places like Jamshedpur. And by quasi-sovereign, I mean that Tata is able uh, to be in a place like Jamshedpur, not just an employer, uh, but also a local government uh, as well as a landowner. And this control over resources is a major reason why Tata has been around for so long uh, and has been able to make a, a Tisco, for example, Tata Steel a success. And finally, the uh, a very important uh, is the philanthropy, but more importantly, it is the networks of expertise. It is all the people that came into the Tata orbit through philanthropy, whether that is in thinking about the TIFR in the realm of science or TIS in the realm of social science uh, and many, many other institutions that were built through Tata's strategic philanthropy and this philanthropy cultivated networks of expertise. So putting these three things together, the major argument of the book is that Tata is in some ways uh, and in some ways and at some times a corporation that acts uh, like a state. Uh, it also acts in conflict with the state whether it's the colonial state or the post-independence Indian state, but it takes upon itself what I call the state-like functions. The state-like function, number one, to invest and to plan and to think ahead. We think about, it is sometimes said about Jamshichi that he was India's one-man planning commission before, of course, the planning commission uh, uh, under Nehru in the 1950s. So um, in the realm of the economy to invest and to plan, in the realm of politics, especially, as I said, in a place like Jamshedpur, to govern and to rule, and in the realm of ethics, to care. Uh, and these are uh, functions that Tata performs. As I say, as a historian, I, take, uh, I try to take a fairly nuanced approach and to say 
that it's not always the same and it changes over time and in different moments. Uh, and to wrap up, uh, another uh, very briefly, I'll be happy to discuss my research more if there are questions about it, but uh, this study is also the first to really use the extraordinary archives of the Tatas in Pune and in Jamshedpur and, uh, and uh, trying to tell the story from within the company uh, as well as from without. So I think that this is the first book that tries to um, give that uses these materials, these incredibly rich materials, which haven't been used by professional historians before, but also that is uh, not coming strictly from within the group. So trying to achieve uh, that balance, but also to bring these materials again uh, to the wider scholarly uh, community as well as to the public. And the final thing I will say for this audience is I want to highlight one additional theme uh, in the book that I think is not often excuse me, appreciate it. And that is whenever I give talks on this book, people always ask me about the leaders. People, one of the most, uh, one of the questions I get asked mo most often by journalists is, did you talk to Ratan Tata? Did you talk to uh, all the chairmen? Did you talk to all the leaders? And I, and the answer is I didn't speak to Ratan Tata. I spoke to some other uh, leaders uh, uh, within the group, but uh, it is my contention in this book that we need to go slightly below the so-called great men of Tata history, where, and that is the chairman, right, from Jamshechi to JRD to Ratan. And I think we need to look at a middle layer uh, of management thought. And in particular, those who read the book might be surprised to see these two people play an incredibly important role. Um, on the left, we have BJ Padsha, who was, as I call him, Jamshechi's right-hand man. In the first half of the book is really dominated by him and his ideas and the way that he was involved in almost every aspect of the group from the economic to the philanthropic. And on the right is Minu Masani, who played a similar role in the post-independence period in the realms of public relations, labor relations, uh, and politics. And so by, and the intellectual influence of these people on the structure and the ethos of the Tata group is something that hasn't been appreciated and I hope will be appreciated by people who read the book. And there's also uh, in the chapter, chapter five, which discusses briefly management education, we can see also institutionally the way that this group is actually actually puts its ideas together and puts its ideas into practice. And that's something that I hope uh, uh, will be looked at because I think too often we have a very simplistic understanding of what it means when we say, you know, the Tata way of doing things with the Tata ethos. Uh, it just, it's just assumed sometimes that it's something that uh, a great man like Jamshechi or JRD or Ratan Tata came up with in their head and, you know, it kind of springs forth, you know, like the goddess Athena, right? It springs forth from their head and then it is uh, sort of followed by the entire group. And the answer, uh, the reality is that it has to be cultivated, developed, and uh, made real actually uh, at all levels of the group. And that's something that uh, the way that happened in Tata is a contribution uh, the uh, book I hope makes. So uh, with that, I'm uh, happy to turn it over and uh, answer questions and uh, discuss. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mircha, for that. Uh, let me mention at, the, at uh, the outset that for participants, if you have a particular question, uh, please go ahead and type it uh, in uh, the, the, the chat box on Zoom. Uh, for those of you who are on Facebook, uh, you can put your questions there also and they'll be transmitted to us. Um, Mr. Kobalakrishna, would you want to ask the, the first question? Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, uh, Mircha, first of all, congratulations on a monumental piece of research. I mean, I've got a library of Tata books, as you can well imagine, and I've read all of them. But uh, this one has a bibliography which is equal to the size of some of those books. So it is a, a tribute to your research. And I didn't realize that the archives had quite so much material. Uh, obviously, as a person who's worked in the system at a board level uh, for uh, as many years as I have, uh, one has a tendency to say, I disagree with you or I agree with you, but that's not the purpose of our discussion. Our discussion is about your book. So I would like to start by asking, I have referred to page 49 of your book. So 
just to show that i have sort of read the book very carefully uh, you refer to the bengali sociologist binoy kumar sarkar and he coined the word tataism and this is sort of 1912 or thereabouts you know early 1900 i didn't know that uh, binoy kumar sarkar who's a sociologist by the way not a tata employee or a public relations uh, person and uh, he used the word tataism to refer to the act of training unskilled workers adivasis to work with sophisticated machinery that was the context in which he used it according to ah can you hear me am i okay yep uh, uh, and then there is another uh, uh, wonderful quotation which i didn't find in your book maybe i missed it but i know from my general knowledge that there was an economist who was researching in 1910 and he wrote to alfred marshall yes in england and he said how can india progress better and alfred marshall wrote him a letter which is lying in some archive somewhere if india had a score or more of men like mr tata and and this is to be listened to carefully by the audience this is alfred marshall writing this in 1912 if india had a thousand people uh, if um, india had a score or more men like mr tata and thousands of men with the japanese interest in realities with virile contempt for speech making in politics and law courts i repeat this is very relevant to today india would soon be a great nation now the question that i want to ask you through your research is on the one hand you have these people who are not tata employees or uh, sociologists economists academics who sort of give tata that role uh, would it not be an outcome of the poor development of infrastructure and governance as it existed in every country at some stage that tata had to step up to the plate and play a larger role the way you state it almost gives the impression that they became extra territorial and uh, i don't know if there's a negative connotation and if there is there's no problem it's just a point of view uh there are two thank you for the question there are two parts to that question i think the extra territorial part i think is not uh about that i think that has more to do with geography yeah yeah it has it has more to do with the with the trading with the history of trade and i think right. it has to do with the fact that tata has maintain those um global facing outlook um more than other businesses i think uh, at the time but the other part of the question is a very interesting uh, and i think the answer has to be yes i think the answer has to be that um that these uh, scholars that you mentioned were looking to tata uh, at the time because of certainly because of the failure of the british colonial state to provide the kind of long term planning and development that many certainly many nationalists were hoping for um or had begun to hope for uh these are some people some of the people that <laughs> dinya studies as well um by the early 20th century but also i think implicit in those quotes is also a deprecation of india's other businessmen and there is a long literature about why certain uh business uh, why certain merchants came on to uh came to invest their money into things like factories into things that like infrastructure that could contribute to long term growth and i think that there is a there is a criticism of the british there's a criticism also of other merchants other leaders that did not follow jamshedji's lead and i think overall it's hard for me to say because i spent so much time focused on tata and i i don't know too much in such detail about their rivals at the time but i think overall it is a not a, an unfair assessment considering what was going on at the time thank you dinyar 
So we have some questions coming in in the Q&A box. I'm going to ask one question and then perhaps we can go to uh, the audience questions. And you know, if necessary, both Mr. Gopalakrishna and I can come in with some follow-up questions as we proceed. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask you a question, you know, kind of touching on, on what you had covered in, the, in, in, in that discussion a little bit also of this, the, the self-identity that uh, the Tatars have. I mean, the, the Tatars have a very strong self-identity that's been pre uh, premised on a, a heritage of ethical and uh, social, socially responsible capitalism. And this is something which you, you, you bring out you know, in, in, in vivid detail throughout your book. Uh, amongst corporates in India or around the world, uh, do, do you feel that the Tatars have been unique in placing such an important on uh, not just history in general, but this specific historical narrative tied to those issues mm. of ethics and social responsibility? Uh, it's a great question. And um, I think it ties back to the previous question, actually, to Mr. Gopal Krishnan's question. And I think, uh, and I want to make another point about Tatism when I'm done, but <laughs> just to answer this question. Um, I think that um, in some ways, many aspects of Tata philanthropy, for example, are not, strictly speaking, unique. The idea of uh, ownership of uh, a holding company by a trust, which is really the cornerstone of, uh, of the structure of the group is also not unique. Uh, it is more prevalent in certain parts of the world than others, um, but uh, it is not, that is not strictly speaking unique. Um, what is unique, I think, is the role that that certainly that philanthropy and that then social responsibility played within Indian history. So I think if you put these two things together, it is somewhat unique. So I think if, if um, those who read the book will read the chapter on philanthropy and will see just the sheer range of things that were being planned and that were being built. And these are all things to go back to the previous question that India needed or that would benefit India and they were not being done by anybody else. So I think it's that combination of things that really makes Tata stand out. And similarly with developing the idea of social responsibility, uh, as I show in the last chapter, Tata is really at the forefront of thinking about what does this term mean and, and how can it be applied in a place like India? Uh, in, in a time when the relationship between business and the government is very uncertain, it's very hostile. Uh, and so thinking about new roles for business in a future oriented way uh, in, a, in a place like India where the private sector was fairly small and fairly weak, um, I think that uh, again really stands out uh, and uh, among uh, in a in a global scale. But I want to say one more thing about Tataism is that in some ways I love that quote and it's a, it's a, a thank you for bringing it up. And sometimes I think that in some ways Benoît Sarkar was being, um, you know, I, I think what he's thinking about is we know we all know the term Fordism, right? The term Fordism which uh, was relates to the mass production, the assembly line, mass production of cars, and then the high wages for the worker so that the worker can afford to buy the cars that he produces, right? So that is the Fordist model that dominated so much of the economy, not just of the United States, but also of the Western world uh, until the 1970s. Um, and I think sometimes I reflect on the fact that Tataism is something that never quite uh, came to pass. Uh, in the same way that India never did become Tataist in the way that, say, America became Fordist. And I think that was a source of regret for Sarkar because Sarkar admired especially uh, the technological uh, aspects uh, of, he admired the spirit of innovation and the spirit of progress represented by a place like Jamshedpur. And I think he, again, would have, would have criticized India for not having uh, um, adopted, shall we say, the Tata way of doing things in a more comprehensive way. Great, thank you. And I, you know, I think Sarkar is a great example again of you know these other individuals that you talk about. I mean, obviously, not someone within the Tatas and not a manager, but these other really important individuals in Indian history who have not, you know, really 
got their due, I guess, in terms of uh, public knowledge today. I mean, very few people know who Sarkar is, just like very few people know about uh, BJ Pancha, for example. Uh, and your book does a, you know, a really excellent job, I think, in that regard of just shining light on these individuals who played such an important role on economic and political thought and debate in this era. Uh, so, Mr. Kopalakrishna, if you don't mind, could I uh, take one or two questions from the audience and then... Of course, you know, of course. Great. Please. So, we have one question from uh, Tanvi, and she has said that the Tata Group is known for its values and its ethos. In your research, did you come across the underlying philosophy of leadership that ensures uh, that the same values and ethos get ingrained in every employee so that the culture is not lost or diluted? Yes, and I think... Uh... I'm not sure that it's, um, I'm gonna answer this question like a historian and not like uh, a, a scholar of management or a scholar of, uh, of uh, ideas in a sense. Um, so as a historian, I will answer and say that the way that that happens is it begins in the 1950s and it begins with the creation of the Tata Staff College, which then becomes TMTC, Tata Management Training Center, and then TAS, Tata Administrative Services. Uh, and it develops into the 1990s again in a different phase, which I don't cover so much uh, in the book. Um, and then it is actually codified, uh, that is to say made into, into a, a coherent uh, a statement. Uh, quite late, actually, in, in the um, 2000s, uh, past the 2000s. And there are other stories there that uh, only insiders will know about the Malcolm Baldridge and, and uh, excellence models and all these other types of metrics and systems that are being developed and implemented across the group. Um, unlike other groups, I think there is no written text, uh, say, the Jamshechi's writings, have not been unfortunately preserved to any great extent. Um, and that's something that every biographer and every scholar of the Tatas has to deal with, has to account for. Um, and I think that in some ways, the process of creating that philosophy and continuing that, uh, that philosophy is, uh, it's very much, it's a tradition. And it's a tradition that exists at the levels of which I've just described, at the levels where it is actually taught to new people who come into the group. Um, and the archives are part of that. So one of the reasons I write in the book, one of the reasons why the archives exist, it's not for people like me, as much as I'd like to think that it's to help people like me write books. It's actually uh, for the public as well, but it is also for, uh, for managers to come in and to learn the history. And I think that is, frankly, one of the... the uh, from my perspective, one of the best things that the group does as a historian. I love the fact that the Tata group is so invested in its own history and in passing on its own history and traditions to new generations uh, that come in. So there's on that level, but on the level of ideas, um, it is sometimes, uh, there's a lot that is unsaid and unwritten, and there's a lot that comes from the personalities uh, of the people that are recruited into the group at the highest levels, uh, and the way that they uh, continue, the way that they react and respond to a changing political and economic environment. So I think that uh, in every era, there's a question of what is the Tata way of doing things, right? In the in the colonial period. Uh, there was there were tensions between how closely you should ally with the nationalist movement versus the British. So what is the what and there are moments in the book where what is the Tata way? We talked about the extraterritorial before uh, issues, for example, when the hydroelectric agency was sold to the Americans. Uh, there was many people who said you shouldn't sell to the Americans because you're a nationalist company, and so. There was conflict and there was hashing out of that. What does it mean to be a Tata uh, uh, in that moment of conflict? In the Nehruvian period, there was, uh, and in the Indira Gandhi period, there were conflicts again over uh, the relationship with the government, over uh, um, you know, participating in corrupt activities and in licensing deals and all these types of things. And then in our uh, recent day and age, we all know that there have been uh, uh, moments of tension between, uh, between uh, different sides and different uh, 
on different issues of expansion and uh, of or contraction of the group and so on, and who does the group serve. So I think that it is out of those moments of conflict uh, in the people who are there who uh, essentially work out, have the challenge of working out among themselves, what is the Tata way of doing things and what is the Tata way of responding. And sometimes that is actually more important than what's written in a document and what's written in a piece of paper. So we have another question from Danish, uh, who says, I'm researching the, the Koja, Memon, and, and Bora communities in colonial Bombay. Uh, and one shortcoming that they faced was the problem regarding succession. Family disputes and long running court battles resulted in their demise. How important do you think uh, the clarity around the succession issue has been in the progress of the Tata group? Fantastic question. And the answer is, uh, the answer is that it is surprising how little succession uh, features as an issue up until very recently. Um, and I think what well, part of the reason why that is, is that, well, th there are, shall we say, demographic reasons, which Dunyar was much more qualified to explain regarding the sheer number of descendants that each member of the family has. Um, there's not too much contention, partly for that reason. But that doesn't explain it, right? That doesn't explain uh, why we see fairly orderly successions and transitions and fairly stable leadership from Jamshedji to Ratan. Um, I think the real answer lies again in that second layer uh, of, of management and the second layer of leadership, which provides that continuity and provides sometimes a certain measure of decentralization, which works well when it works. Um, so uh, there are many other people within the, many other leaders within the Tata group that can take the uh, attention away, shall we say, from what's going on in Bombay House. And I think that that's part of the reason, that's part of the strength of the group. Now, sometimes as in the case of the succession from JRD to Ratan, which I don't discuss in the book because it's a little bit after the period that, that, that I write about. So sometimes that can be an issue when you have sort of different power centers and that hasn't really been replicated uh, since then. Uh, but that was also just its own particular strange moment having to do that was right at the time of the transition of the Indian economy uh, to a liberalization. So there were uh, all sorts of issues there that were specific to that moment. But in general, succession has not been uh, so much of a problem in Tata. And you had quite a remarkable stability uh, at the top. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why Tata has remained uh, in that spot is the way the group is held together. And I should add just the trusts play a huge role in that. The fact that uh, Dorabji and uh, Ratanji's shares went into those trusts and then creating that model uh, provided a stability even when the group was decentralizing. Uh, quite dramatically in terms of share ownership uh, across different companies in the 70s, 80s. Um, so uh, we can imagine an alternative universe where those shares weren't vested in those trusts and maybe they each had two, two sons, say, uh, and then we would have seen perhaps a more traditional pattern uh, that we might see uh, and more, more familiar set of conflicts. Neeraj has uh, put two questions in, in the chat box. Um, what type of coordination would be required between the trusts and, and various Tata directors and boards? And how would the Tatas be like when there is no Tata? Uh, so it, you know, at least for the first question, I wonder if maybe you can talk a little bit about what the relationship is like for us. I mean, for those who don't really know the background of what the relation is like between the trusts and, and the various uh, you know, boards and directors and such within, within the Tata companies. Yes, so the trusts own 80% uh, of the shares uh, initially of the main holding company Tata Sons. I believe that's now down to 66, but I, I can be corrected on that. Um, and throughout the early years, I think the relationship was one that was very much an arm's length relationship in terms of, uh, in terms of the way that the company actually 
of the group actually operates. And I think, although as I write in the book at the end of the third chapter, there was a moment right after independence, right at the time of independence, when there's a lot of debate within the group um, over how much, excuse me, role the trust should play uh, in the actual uh, interests of the group. So in, at that time, again, the challenge was that you had a very unfriendly government, a very unfriendly state that was bent to, on regulating or restricting private business. And so the question that was being asked then was, should we use the goodwill uh, uh, by, by, of the trusts to essentially try and to help the fortunes of our of our businesses. And, and there was a lot of skepticism of that idea from, and I, I write out the conflicts and discussions that happened around that issue. And some people said, good works are separate from, from our money making activities. Um, in terms of the, more recently, I think there has been with this most recent set of conflicts around succession, I think there has been some questions that were raised about uh, whether or not the trusts have too close of a relationship uh, to the operations uh, of the companies. But again, it's very hard to disentangle that from the particular circumstances of the moment. And I think one of the issues in the recent mystery, uh, Ratan, uh, from my understanding, one of the issues is that you get into a bad situation when the revenue starts to go down. If the revenue starts to go down, you then create a negative cycle where uh, the trusts don't have as much money to spend uh, on, on their good works. And that also in turn impacts the company. So you create a kind of vicious cycle that needs to be stopped. So that, but that is actually, that is number one, an inherent risk in having a model where charitable trusts own uh, stock. And secondly, it also is a particular feature of the of this particular moment. But historically, the this, the relationship was quite uh, at arm's length. And the second question was about what will happen with Tata without Tata. And I have to say that I, I have no uh, idea what will happen. But I think uh, that uh, so far, shall we say that I'm probably based on my experience more positive about about that outcome that I don't actually think that Tata necessarily needs a Tata um, and that what really matters is to have somebody in charge and I from very limited information that I have it seems that is that is the case now is to have someone in charge that is uh, truly familiar with uh, and uh, interested in uh, the history, tradition, and way of doing things of the group. So um, I will say if, if Tata, just speaking personally, if I one day in five years open up the newspaper and find that a totally external chairman has been brought in, I would have questions. Uh, but at the moment, I think it seems that the group is in good hands and uh, provides the stability that is necessary. So I think so, so far, I, I don't see any reason why a Tata should be in charge. Uh, but I think if a purely, if a pure outsider is brought in, uh, it would be interesting uh, to see what that would be like. The next question will require you to put your, your management studies hat on. Uh -oh. uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, a question about uh, any example which, which you might uh, have in, uncovered in your research about errors and mistakes and uh, the, the, the practice of resilience in, in terms of what the Tatas did in order to, to demonstrate accepting of an error, fixing it and moving on. Um, are there any examples of such value-driven recovery from problematic situations that you uncovered? Great question. Um... There are several, but I think the one that I want to talk about is the one that uh, is in the first chapter, which I think has the most relevance to the present day. And that is uh, the conflict between uh, Dorabji and R.D. Tata over the uh, extent of investments abroad, and particularly the extent of continuing to invest in trade versus industry. So, um, there's an assumption that the transition from the Tatas began as traders. They were making money in the cotton, opium, uh, textiles, other 
uh, types of and uh, many other primary commodities, what we would call them, across the Indian Ocean uh, and in those connections with East Asia. Uh, but they were at the same time investing in those big projects, which I showed you on the slide, the textile mills, the steel plant, the hydroelectric dams. And there was, as I show in the book, an increasing tension between these two types of activity. And sometimes if you lost a lot of money in those very risky trades, that could impact your investments at home. And there were all sorts of things having to do with corporate structure because the companies that were doing the trading were separate from the Tata Sons, but at the same time they were interrelated and they helped each other out financially. And RD was the cousin, he was in charge of the trading company and then Dorabji uh, was in charge of, uh, of, of the industrial side as it were. And so what you see is uh, that the trading side begins to lose a lot of money. And there's a lot of issues also with the people on the spot in London uh, actually committing fraud uh, and um, leading to some pretty uh, severe outcomes in terms of the bankruptcy of Tata Limited, which is the um, UK subsidiary. And there's a realization, I think, in that moment that a decisive reorientation towards India and towards the domestic market is necessary. And this is also the time of the Great Depression coming into the Great Depression and the time uh, when there, the opportunities to grow and expand within India are greater than the opportunities outside of India. And I think uh, to, so despite what I've said about the extra, that extra territory, which is always trying to maintain your links abroad, which had always been the Tata way of doing, you know, part of the Tata way of doing things. And it resumes very much after world, the war, after World War II uh, and independence, it resumes. Uh, but at the moment, there was a decision made that this is where we need to focus on, uh, for example, by improving our domestic sales department uh, in Tisco and really uh, trying to compete for those domestic markets. And um, I think that that's an example where the group faced a challenging moment. There was a problem of authority. There was a problem of chain of command. There was a problem of uh, who was in charge. And Padsha, who I mentioned before on the left of my slide, Padsha played a crucial role there in mediating when the conflicts between the uh, brother and the cousin were getting intense, he comes in and he's the person that really brings everybody together. So it is, I would say that's the first example that comes to mind. And um, I think it's, it's a great example of how, uh, you know, of how you can change direction and acknowledge, and certainly there was an acknowledgement uh, of, of the fact that they had, uh, there was lax oversight, uh, but also there was a question of overall strategy. There was a question of where do we want to go? And I think in moments, certainly in moments of, we are now in a big crisis today, um, certainly that kind of strategic clarity is very important of which direction we want to go in, uh, in, in such moments. I'm going to ask you one question and then perhaps Mr. Kupala Krishnan can come in with, with another. Uh, one of the factors that you, you list behind the resilience of the Tatas um, and their autonomy over, over uh, the many decades that they've been so uh, dominant um, is you know, access to international markets, connections with international finance and, and networks of international expertise. And you talk a lot yes. about how that you know was important, whether it was you know the steel mills in Jamshedpur or or even say TIFR in, in, here in Bombay. Uh, given the role of Swadeshi in Indian history, uh, and given current day slogans that we hear a lot about, like Atman Nirbar and such, um, what can the Tatas' experience teach us about globalization and the Indian economy? I think that's volume two of my book. So. <laughs> Um, uh, big question. Um, what I've tried to suggest in the book is just to go back to something I was saying earlier. What I've tried to suggest in the book is that uh, when we talk about, for example, Swadeshi, um, it is oftentimes assumed that there's almost like um, I use the metaphor of Athena and uh, now I'm going to use an animal metaphor and say that there's a kind of signal like an ant colony, you know, where uh, everybody just knows what to do and they kind of automatically do it. So the, I think sometimes when we write the history, 
of uh, of things like nationalism. There's just an assumption that sometime around 1880 or 1890, everybody gets a secret chemical signal that they should be protectionist, that they should focus on domestic markets, the tariff barriers should go up, uh, and that they should, uh, you know, serve the nation. And everybody, every individual economic agent uh, follows that secret signal, right? And that's not how human beings work. And that's not how history works, right? So there are many contradictions embodied in Swadeshi. And there are many, um, uh, and it, it takes a long, and one of the things I write in the book is it takes a long time, right? So the, it, by the depression, I argue, as a result of what I've just said, the story I've just told about Tata Limited and, and RD, Tata and all that stuff. Uh, there is definitely a shift towards domestic markets. There's also a shift very clearly in the 1950s to collaborate with the US. Um, uh, and there are many other such shifts throughout the history of the group. But uh, this first one by the 1930s, it's a very long time from when Jamshechi is actually born and when the group actually gets started. So it's a long time from the creation of the Empress Mills in Nagpur in 1877. So it's a very slow process. And it's a process that I argue exposes the fact that oftentimes the Swadeshi enterprise depends on global finance. So to build a TISCO, you need access to uh to the london market now they don't get that access they get the princes and there's that, that whole long story um but uh, the hydro for example goes a different direction in the hydro they do uh the financing uh gap matters uh and then they end up as i said temporarily selling that to an american uh conglomerate so I think that sometimes uh, Swadeshi can mean paradoxically becoming more global. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I also argue in the book that the economic Swadeshi, the idea of nation building, Jamshechi's idea was powerful because it was uh, economic nationalism. It was building the uh, uh, economic infrastructure India needed without necessarily being politically nationalist in such an overt way as many other uh, of his colleagues and rivals were. So I think when we talk about Swadeshi or self-reliance, we also have to distinguish between, so we have to distinguish between which aspects, how much we engage with the global economy, number one. So how much are we truly India only and how much is engaging with the global economy in the service of Indian development. That's one aspect. And the other one is how much do we engage with politics and how much do we engage with that realm? Uh, uh, and I think the lessons are not easy to, to draw. And I think that I tried to provide that more realistic perspective rather than just saying that people all of a sudden one day woke up and decided to do things for the nation. I think there's a lot more that's complicated underneath that. Mr. Kobanakrishnan, would you like to ask a question? Um, you know, first of all, I'd like to say that our discussion, brief as it has been, has touched upon the many ambiguities in apparent clarity. You know, Swadeshi, Atmanirbhar, capitalism. So your book itself says capitalist, but Tatas are not capitalist. J.R.D. Tata famously said we are socialistically capital, whatever that means. So I think the fact that there are these ambiguities has been well recognized and brought out. And I'm very happy about that, not to quibble about the odd point here and there. Since this is being hosted by the Center for Wisdom and Leadership, I thought I would point out one thing, which also came out of the discussion we had a little while ago. Uh, I consider having worked in Tata's and also having read your book, Tata is a microcosm of India. It is huge in its species. It's got lots of people. It is multifaceted. It is multi-ethnic, multi-religious. Um, it's multi-dimensional, full of contradictions, and yet finds a way forward. And that's India. Uh, India doesn't have a written book, um, unlike the Judaic or uh, Christian or Arabic uh, uh, religions. All of India's religions say 
uh, this is a point of view, question it. And uh, Tata is exactly that. <laughs> this is the way I want to run my business. You can question it. And the fact that various people questioned it was brought out in the way you spoke about RD and Dorabji, Dorabji and Navroji Saklatwala, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm very happy that some uh, hidden nuggets which are related to the CWIL have also come out. And while it's not your subject of your book, you know, one of the points on your page 21, I think, or page 26, you say, Jamshedji Tata spent all his entrepreneurial energy um, overcoming obstacles posed by the government <laughs> rather than in entrepreneurship. And you could say the same 100 years later today, a lot of our entrepreneurial energy goes in dealing with the government. We still have last week's newspaper and next week's newspaper will have that stuff. The quality and the character of it may change. So one of the things is uh, India is a classic essay in, depending on which point of view you want to take, a management by confusion, as Churchill called it, or management by learning to live with ambiguities rather than remove them. And Tata is a good example of that. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was very struck by in your book, you brought out the fact that uh, in the Gilded Age, uh, people took to philanthropy to expiate their sins. Whereas there's no such pressure on Jamshedji Tata. He did it of his own free will, based on religion, personal philosophy, whatever it may be. And it struck me, having worked in Unilever myself, that there was a trend outside America, in England, of Fabian socialism. And since I worked in Unilever, I know that Lord Leverhulme had very similar ideas. Jamshedji Tata. And when he set up Port Sunlight, it was a replica of... Uh, Jamshedpur without their ever having met or discussed it. So I think you brought out some very uh, interesting facets which can play on a much larger uh, uh, platform. I, as I said, I'm not going to ask a question because you're running out of time, uh, Dinyar, and I don't want to engage. But I did want to try to add value by saying there's a great relevance to the CWIL's quest that... Uh, your book provides data for CWL to take further and build on. Say, how is Indian wisdom? And I think a lot of traditional Indian wisdom or lack of wisdom is reflected in the way Tata operates. Tata is a microcosm of India. And I just thought I would like to make that contribution before you close. Thank you. That's a wonderful point. Yes. That actually provides us with a, with a very good way to close uh, today's session. Um, the Tatas, in many ways, representing the, the various contradictions that we have within Indian society. Uh, so with that, I would like to end uh, today's uh, event. Many thanks to uh, Mirsha for joining us from, from the U.S. Uh, many thanks to Mr. Kapala Krishnan uh, for, for joining us also from Punur, uh, to, to Surya for being here, and to, to all the members of the, uh, the CWIL uh, team for, for organizing this event. Uh, once more, the, the book is, is, is Tata, the corporation, the global corporation that built Indian capitalism, published by Harvard University Press. Um, we recommend that you, you read it to get a, a good understanding, not just of this particular corporation, but also in many ways, uh, the, the story of modern India, and how uh, various political and economic dynamics have evolved uh, over the past century and a half. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll end uh, our discussion for today. Surya, did you have anything to add or... Uh, shall we uh, end uh, the conversation? Uh, no, I just would like to thank uh, all of you. And um, as uh, Gopal Krishnan said, yeah, uh, I hope to continue this kind of, uh, let's say, conversation where we can bring all these different, uh, let's say, ways of looking at uh, a corporation other than the pure economic or the pure historian bring wisdom, bring so many various elements. I think this is something which is very fertile ground. And this is exactly what we want to do at, uh, at this center. So thanks a lot uh, for the quality of your uh, presentation, Mircha, and um, your questions, Dinyar and Gopala Krishnan, your insights. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening Great. and have a good weekend, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone.